Good morning and welcome to Hope. We're so glad, I'm so glad that you're here this morning. And uh, just by way of, these are wonderful, I, I know you guys hear these words every week, and this is just a good reminder every week. We here at Hope, we exist to model Jesus, to make Jesus alive to one another in our homes and in our communities. And so as we worship God together this morning, modeling Jesus also looks like putting all of our hearts toward God, worshiping God together. Sure. 
continue on in worship we come to a time that we confess our sins together as a community let's let's be seated take take a seat now and let's take this time together as a community to remember the cause of Christ was you is you and our cause in our relationship is to reconcile our relationship to Christ. So we're going to spend this time as a community and confess our sins together to God and then spend time as individuals confessing our sins, reconciling our relationship to Him. Our Lord Jesus said, You shall love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul. And with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. As God has instructed us in these great commandments. And because we have not lived in full obedience. Let us confess our sins to God. Trusting Christ as our Savior. And Lord, let us pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name 
Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us continue to worship the Lord together, confessing our sins as individuals in silence. Friends, look up and receive these words of encouragement. Since we are justi justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. Amen. Let's continue in worshiping God, responding in song. You can choose to stand or sit, but let's respond to the Lord's faithfulness.
Lord, your steadfast love and your steadfast faithfulness knows no limits. And it is precisely because of that steadfast love and faithfulness for us, humans, we get to be with you, see you, experience grace and joy and freedom. Thank you, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. If this is your first time to Hope, glad that you are here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for visiting us. If you're joining us later online uh, or right now, welcome and glad that you guys are here together joining us as well. Hope exists to model Jesus to each other, to make Jesus alive. We do that worshiping together. We do that in our communities. And we do that within our small communities in our homes. So uh, thank you for visiting us. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. And um, I'd like to kick off a new sermon series this morning. We have been sitting in and sifting through Nehemiah and Ezra for the past couple of months. And we ended off last week with Nehemiah and the people becoming known as the people of the book. And so what I want to frame here is, is this. The people had many issues, right? They had social issues, economic issues, religious issues. They just had a whole ton of issues going on. Yet, they focused on learning the Word of God. They weren't minimizing these issues. But rather, what they were indicating or implying or saying is that the Word of God was, the, was important and the lens to which they can look at these issues. So they became known as the people of the book. So again, these problems, personal problems, communal problems, were not relegated. They were not minimized. They were important, and they needed help. With this, they said, let's become people of the book and study the word of God. That's where we ended off. Now, today, we begin a new series in Galatians. Now, for the next couple of months, we're going to be in Galatians. And one of the things that I've learned from my, my brother here, Brandon, you know, there are certain things that I just want to skip in the Word of God. I want to skip this, and I learned this from Lisa and uh, also. And these, these two would always give me the furrowed brow in the eyes and say, well, you just can't skip things. The Word is the Word. That is absolutely true, and I will try, and we will try, and we will stay in the Word that way, because I think it's important. Whether we think it's important or not, it's there, and we're going to read through it. Now, Galatians here, while we work through Galatians, chapter by chapter, Paul emphasizes something here, one thing, and he emphasizes the gospel. He emphasizes the word of God right. And this is where he spends his energy, focusing on making sure that the people aren't just people of the book, but rather that they have a good understanding of the purpose of the book, the gospel. And so Paul here spends time making sure people understand this. And that's where we begin today. That's where we begin our series. That's where we begin this morning. So Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 to 10. Hear now the word of the Lord. You can follow along in your programs. Um, if you didn't pick one up, they're over there. You can follow along on the screen, on your phones, as I read, or just listen. Galatians chapter 1. Verses 1 to 10. Paul, an apostle not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, 
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. According to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray before we dive in together. Lord Father, thank you for calling us your children. Thank you for your steadfast love. Thank you for loving us, not for what we do, not for what we will do, or what we have done. Your cause is us, to love us as we are, to save us from where we're going, and to give us hope. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, just to give you a little, little broad strokes to get us hooked in, to, to tell you what's going on here as we dive into Galatians for the first time. Now, Paul, uh, on a, he, he had multiple missionary journeys. One, two, three, four. Now, Galatia, he evangelized to Galatia on his first missionary journey. And what he had done was he, he started a few churches in Galatia, and then he went back home to Jerusalem. While he was in home, at home in Jerusalem, he heard, hey, Something is going on in Galatia. Something is afoot. The things that we preached, there are a few people there called Judaizers who are going around and changing what we preached. Changing the core of the message, the core of the gospel. And, he, and so he writes this letter. And when he writes this letter to the churches of Galatia, my gosh, if you... If you Read with me here. If you, if you dove in with me, this letter was scathing. You can feel the anger from Paul. There is love. There is anger. There is befuddlement. There is just what's going on. How we know this? Here are some few tips. When you look at the letter, at the beginning of the letter, the letter says, uh, hey, greetings to you, peace to you, and so on and so forth. And usually, if you look at all of all, all other Paul's letters, it's like, hey, listen, thankful for you, thankful for God, flowers, birds, happies, bees, and all that stuff. But here, it's not that at all. It's, hey, grace, peace to you. I'm an apostle. Don't forget that. And let me tell you what. You're messed up. That's it. He dives right into it. There is anger. There is befuddlement. And Paul wants to make this right. And these Judaizers are skewing things, changing things, adding things, twisting things to the point that it's no longer known as the gospel. So Paul, in this letter, repeats the word gospel. Quite a few times, this is the gospel. Don't turn away from the gospel. Not that there is another gospel. There's only one gospel. But don't turn away from this gospel. People are adding to the gospel. He repeats the word gospel. Why is Paul so concerned about this gospel? 
Why is he so concerned? What we will find out through this series, and a little bit today, is that understanding the gospel, getting it right, is of the utmost importance as a believer and as a person thinking about faith. Why? Because it directly affects the way you live, the way you see things, the way you receive, experience, life. The gospel is powerful. It's not just a story. There is power. And because of that, it is absolutely important. And Paul understands this, that these, church, that these churches in Galatia get it right. So as we look here, we're going to find this out. What is then the gospel? Do you believe in it? Do you understand it? Do you grasp it? What does Paul actually say to these Galatians about the gospel that we can learn today? That we can apply today? Now what we'll find out is that Paul makes it clear that this gospel is not just a story. There is power. They're not just words. There is power. It is from God. There's only one. And understanding the gospel convicts and compels. So there is power in this gospel because it is from God. And that's what he does first and foremost, right? Right off the bat, in verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Now, when you look a little bit above this letter in the greeting, Paul takes time to say, everything that I do is because of God. Everything that I have, that I have experienced, everything, everything that I think about is because of Christ Jesus. He is giving God the credit. I'm an apostle because Christ called me. I do this because Christ gave me the strength and the power. I started these churches because God gave me the power. He does not take any instant here, instance here to take credit for the things that he had already done. I mean, look at this guy. He is the man. He started churches in Galatia. Yet he does not take credit. Everything is credited to God. And in here, he reminds people in the greeting that, yeah, God called me. God gave me this gospel. The gospel is from God. And not only that, grace and peace to you. That's from God. Now, what you have to understand about Paul is this. Paul was made fun of all throughout his journeys. Um, there are some accounts where we can see that, uh, you know, Paul was this, not that there's anything bald, wrong with being bald, but that he was a small, bald man with crooked limbs and people used to make fun of him. Who knows if that's true? There are some accounts out there, but the point is that he was constantly made fun of because of his appearance. Who are you? You're small. You're nothing. You don't have anything. And all of his opponents, enemies, anywhere he went made fun of him. That was their first line of defense, first line of attack. That's kind of funny, right? That's, that kind of feels like a schoolyard bully. But Paul doesn't care. He plows deeply into his weaknesses. And you will see again and again and again that Paul says, when I am weak, I am strong. When I am small, God is big. Yeah, I am weak and I need God. Yes, I don't have the power. I need God's power. And you will see this again and again. Now, why this is important is because this segues into the rest of the letter. This gospel that we preached to you previously isn't from him. It's from God. 
Not only that, it's not just a story. There is power. There is power in its calling. And that's what we see here in verse 6. He's astonished that people are so quickly deserting him. The one who called you in the grace of Christ, because that's what the gospel does. It calls you. There is power. Now, I have to talk about this because we have a different picture, I assume, of what it looks like to be called, right? Either you as a child or you to your children have experienced this on either side, parent and child. Now, I have called my children to me quite a few times in their lives and in my lives. But do they come? No, not always. Have you been called by your parents and said, hey, you're, just imagine you're in a home, right? Hey, hey, Lisa, Brandon, Jenny, <laughs> come on over. Come on, let's have a family meeting. Yeah, I'll, I'll be there. I'll be there. Yeah, I'll be there. If I, as a parent, look to my children and say, hey, children, come on over. It's family meeting time or it's dinner time or, hey, we're all going to you know, go out for a walk. Yeah, dad, let me finish this game. You're, you're, you're going to make me wait? That's my first thought in my mind. No, you're not going to finish this game. You're going to come when I call. Um, I, I experienced this as a parent with my children. I experienced this as a dog owner. Come dog, come dog. Yeah. I mean, they go all over before they come back to me. So the understanding of calling, right, there isn't really any real power or draw. It, the calling is we call and we go out and get them. Right? There's, 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 it's a very different picture. So when you hear this word, the gospel calls you, we think it, oh, it, it's just, hey, we're calling you. Yeah. Oh, we'll get there, God. Well, when it's time. That's not what's going on here. Paul is saying there is real power in the gospel. It's not just a story. It has the power to call you and draw you because the gospel is from God. It's the word of God from God. And what have we seen with God and his words and his call? When Jesus called the winds and the storm on the boat to calm and be quiet, what happened? Calm and quiet. There is power in these words. When Jesus called Lazarus to him to get up, Lazarus was dead by all accounts, but he got up and came. When God simply said, let there be light, there was incredible energy and power. There are, there is power. And there's a clear difference between our understanding of calling and God's call. When we call and God calls, utter difference. When God calls through his word, in the gospel, there is power. It draws you. It changes you. It gives you strength. It gives you wisdom. It changes the way you see things, the way you receive things, the way you apply solutions in your life, the way that you relate with each other. If you are a believer of Christ, have you felt this? Have you at one point in your life sensed that there is something going on? I can't articulate it, but there is something going on. 
and it changed you. Here's what it did for Paul in his smallness, with his baldness, with his crooked limbs. He constantly said, I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed of who I am. And I am not ashamed of this gospel that I know. And I'm going to preach it. Even no matter what you think of me. Because there is power. Because it's from God. People's words have power. They surely do. They can degrade you. They can hurt you. They can belittle you. And I am sure that Paul was not immune to this. Yet he found strength to continue on and to go on, boasting in his weakness. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, gospel excuse me, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. There is this, there was, and there is this theme going around that Christianity is a crutch. That you're a weak person without it if you're a Christian and you're a believer. And this is what I say, and this is what the gospel compels you to say. So what? Yeah, I am weak and I need it. I am weak and I need it. And in my weakness, I have strength. In my nothingness and smallness, I have God's power. That's what it does. The gospel isn't just a story. There is power. Now, Paul makes it clear that there's only one gospel. Only one. If you add something to it, it's no longer the gospel. That's what Paul is making clear. Right? He, he, he said... There's only one gospel. Stop believing in a different gospel. But then he goes to say, not that there is another gospel. Meaning, if you add something to this gospel or delete something to this gospel, it is no longer the gospel. Paul is making it extremely clear. There's only one one gospel. That's what he does, continuing on in this letter. And the way he, he, he does that, the way he shares that there is only one gospel, he also continues by sharing his grievances. Listen, you've changed this gospel, number one. So it's not the gospel anymore. Number two, you left God. What does that say about this then? Those are his two grievances. You changed the gospel and you left God. By changing the gospel, you are leaving God. Let's dive into this context a little bit more. Now, in this time in Galatia, people were hungry. They were hungry for something spiritual and something deep. That's what was going on, right? And so it's not that these Judaizers you know, created a movement on their own. No, there was something already going on. People were hungry, and these Judaizers tapped into this. And the way they tapped into this is this, particularly. And to just make it very clear, all right, we're going to talk about what the gospel is here, and then the Judaizers added to this gospel. Okay, I know I'm repeating a lot of words here. One word, repeatedly. Now, if we go to 1 Corinthians Chapter 15, verses 3 to 4, Paul defines the gospel. Right? Because we're talking about it. So then what really is it? What is it? For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. That's it! That's it! That's the gospel. He puts it so Clearly, here's another way he put it, okay? Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, 
which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's it. We are broken. We need help. God sent his son, Jesus, to save us from our brokenness heading toward eternal separation from God. Hell. And Jesus not only died, he resurrected. Meaning he wasn't just a human. He was the son of God himself. Meaning Jesus lived the life that we should have and died the death that we should have. And by simply believing in this story, which is the good news, that's what the gospel is. Because it didn't really have any particular meaning until, for us until today. But at this time, the gospel just simply meant good news. Good tidings. And this is the good news that Jesus died for you instead of you. If you wanted to be with God. And so people were so hungry for this. People were so hungry for this spiritual something in Galatia. They heard this news. But then these Judaizers added something on. And they said, well, you can believe in Jesus. You should believe in Jesus. But also, but also, you need to be circumcised and eat the right foods. That's what they centered on. You need to be circumcised and eat the right foods. Then you're a real Christian. All right? So you can believe in Jesus. You, but, but also, also, don't forget, you got to eat the right foods. It can't be sacrificed to, to God's. And it can't, it can't, it can't uh, it's got to be purified. All of these things. And also, at the same time, you got to be clean. They handed this. And because the people were hungry in that environment, they gobbled it up. They gobbled it up. Oh, yeah, I think that's the next level. We want more. We want spiritual depth. We want more. And they gobbled it up, and they just, everything changed and twisted. That's what Paul was hearing. And this is what Paul was preaching against. This is what the letter was against. What are you doing? Because think of the implications of this new and twisted gospel. Well, guess what? God loves you because of the things that you do. That's what it does. Well, what does that look like in your life then? Well, guess what? You've got to be perfect. You've got to come to church every Sunday. You've got to pray every day. You've got to read the Bible every day. And then also believe in Jesus. How does that change you? Oh my gosh. It changes your view of God. It changes your view of other people. You look at God maybe as a burden now. Oh, I have to do this. Oh, I got to be there. Oh, they're not praying. Oh, those people, they're, they're, they're not praying. That person, he's not wearing a suit to church. Mm -mm. It changes the way we see things. It changes the way we receive things. But imagine the gospel, just the gospel that says, God, you're his cause. Jesus Christ's cause for his life is you. And what have you done up to this point? Nothing good. Perfectly pure. Yet he still came after you. He still loved you for you. Now, what does that do? It changes your mind. It compels you to follow him more. It compels you and convicts you to listen to his word even more. God, I want to know this more. That's what the gospel is. It changes you. Now recently, I have tried to change in the way that I model Jesus to my children. I've tried. 
my brain didn't respond <laughs> or something didn't respond. So uh, I had to redeem something in particular with one of my sons and it, it had to do with baseball. And uh, I was this child's coach for over a, uh, eight years. And I stopped for the last year or so because I realized there was some, something wrong here. Because after every play, this kid looked at me. <laughs> after every swing. Okay, he's looking for something. That's, that's really not good, number one. Number two, um, he wasn't enjoying the game the way I enjoyed the game. I'm telling, I'm telling this guy, you should enjoy the game. But how could he? Because he had this father that was his coach that twisted all sorts of things together, that communicated a message. I only love you if you get a grand slam. Okay, for those of you who don't know baseball, it's a home run with, you know, everybody on base, and then you get four points. Four runs. Somehow he received that message. Somehow. And so his approach to baseball was anxiety, maybe avoidance. And in my mind, it was, how can you not love baseball? Because it's the best sport on earth. So the last two years, I spent it trying to repair that. Because again, it changes you. Because I wanted to model Jesus to this kid, right? And so here's what it looks like today. We go to a batting practice about three times a week in the morning. Uh, sometimes it's, it was at six, sometimes it's seven, sometimes it's eight, whenever, whenever, right? So we go for an hour. There are so many things I want to say. After each hit, after each swing, I just want to say something. I just want to fix something. But I bite my tongue and I say, oh, good job. Oh, excellent hit. And I really mean it. I really mean it. This isn't fake. I really mean it. But I choose to emphasize, I love you for you. I love you for you. I hope it's changed the way he's viewed the game because now I see him go after teams and excited about, you know, baseball and equipment in ways that I've never seen him before. It changed him. I think. I hope. There's still a mixture of this legalistic father. Do this first and then I love you. But there's this work that I'm constantly doing to say, no, I need to know and remember what Jesus did for me first. Experience that and communicate that. It compelled me. It convicted me to communicate that because it changed the way that I raise my kids. It changed the way that I see people. It changed the way that I interact even with my spouse, my wife. You're the best, Jane. Whatever you want. Not always. But it really changes you that's the power of the gospel there's only one it's not just a story and understanding and grasping it that jesus loves you for you and just you and what he did the good news has the power to change you now paul in this letter as he continues on yeah there's only one gospel but you got to know why it's happening why did jesus have to do this stuff because there is a Massive cosmic battle going on. And, you know, I, I have to ask you, why? And we humans kind of love knowing this stuff. That's why I think the Marvel Cinematic Universe does so well. Right, Chris? Good job. He's such the fan. Um, it, because people love knowing that there's something else. There is someone on your behalf, a hero, a God that is fighting for you from eternal doom into oblivion. We kind of like that. But guess what? There is exactly that going on. That's what this gospel is about. It's not just a story. There is a cosmic battle going on. Something that we can't see. Something that's been there forever. 
vying for you, your death, or the hero, Jesus Christ, your life. And that's what Paul is doing. He's drawing people to understand that this gospel is not just a story. It's real. There is something cosmic going on, battling for you. And Jesus, this hero, stakes his life for you because you are his cause. That's the gospel. Not because of what you do, Not because of what you will do, but just for you. So I pray that this understanding compels you and convicts you to a life pleasing to God. Right? To a life pleasing to God. It's not the other way around. Here, the letter, he makes it very clear that order matters. Order matters. You see, the Judaizers were saying the other way. Do this, 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 and believe in Jesus, and he loves you. Then you you will be saved. But the gospel is, no, believe in Jesus that he loves you and saved you, and be convicted and compelled to live a life pleasing for God. So the word does matter. Knowing the word does matter. Following God does matter. Praying does matter. You matter. The issues that you carry in your heart matter. The problems in your life matter. The social issues of this country matter. The economic issues of this country matter. Matter. The things that you struggle with internally, who you are, your identity, that matters. You matter. The gospel says you matter first and foremost. And I pray that convicts you and compels you and changes you. That's what the gospel does. Let's pray. Shortly, we're going to come to take the Lord's Supper. Communion. And I pray that you do take this time to think about the gospel and what it means to you. What it is and what it should be. Have you added on to the gospel? Have you required something of yourself that you shouldn't? Or on the flip side, have you not done what you were compelled to because of Jesus' love for you? Such as forgiving others. Reconciling with each other. Loving each other as you are. And communicating that. Think about these things before we come to the Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Father, it's a journey. We admit that we do change the gospel every day. And it really affects us sometimes in a very negative way in the way we view our work, in the, in the way we view our coworkers, in the, in the way that we view our friends and community. Thank you for showing us that there was a reason why Paul fought to make sure that people understood that there was only one, only one good news. And I pray that as we Think about this good news. That we steep ourselves in the knowledge and understanding that you loved us first and just for us. 
And I pray that we love you, not for what you do for us or don't do, but for you. In your name we pray. Amen. grace that God gives and has given. Steep yourself in the peace that he provides and take this grace and peace. Model that grace and peace. Model Jesus to one another for the rest of this week to those who you connect with in your homes, in your workplaces, and in this community. 
Now, may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.